Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Yannicka, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Wait, first, did I get it right? I got it right. You got it right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well done. Yeah, so my name is uh, Yannicka Koert. Um, uh, I'm um, a neuropsychologist uh, working in the Netherlands. Um, and as a neuropsychologist, I mainly work as a, as a researcher. Um, so I'm at the University of Groningen, uh, to be precise. So that's uh, all the way in the north of the Netherlands. I'm not attempting that one. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I get that. <laughs> The, the 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 Dutch G is in there, Groningen, really. Um, but so that that's where I am uh, at this moment, and um, yeah, working here at the university, um, um, working in teaching. So I'm working in the bachelor program of psychology, and also in a master program for clinical neuropsychology, and on top of that, I'm doing scientific research, um, which is um, yeah, focused at least in part on ADHD and especially on uh, finances and um, I look um, to finances, financial well-being, financial capability in groups um, like people living with ADHD, but also in other conditions. So people who live with a neurological um, or uh, psychiatric condition. So that's me in a nutshell. Can I ask about how you got interested or come across the work into ADHD, like where your interest stems from? Like, if, do you have ADHD or is, I mean, is it well accepted over there as well too? In the United States, it's been completely kind of shut off and cut off from a lot of things. And I think over the past eight, almost maybe 10 years, it's starting to see a change, which is like, great. Right. When I'm like either an adult or out of school, like where was that when I needed it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I got started in it uh, by collaborating with some uh, with some colleagues who were already interested uh, in ADHD and were working in that field already for quite a while. So originally uh, I did my PhD on Parkinson's disease, which is, of course, something totally different um, and also approached that topic from a neuropsychological point of view. So looking into um, basically the cognitive symptoms and the affective symptoms. And then um, I met, um, um, we had a new professor here in, the, in our department, which was Professor Oliver Tucha. Maybe you heard of him. Um, he's doing a lot of research also in the field of ADHD. And I started to collaborate with him. And um, so that's how I got started um, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the field of ADHD. And uh, then started looking into um, also a lot of yeah the neuropsychological aspects uh, of ADHD. So that's where it all got started basically. And um, over the last years, um, um, because finances really became my topic, as I said, not only in ADHD, also in other conditions. But one thing I I really realized over time is that as neuropsychologists, we're often very much focused on. Um, looking into somebody's memory or how somebody, um, how their organizational skills are, how their attention is and, and things like that to say something about somebody's strengths and weaknesses or to um, in, in um, one way or another contribute to a certain diagnosis. But what is very, very hard based on the materials that we have and the way that we work is very hard to predict what people suffer from in their everyday life. And this is a part, this everyday life that I've found out over time, this is what fascinates me most. So what are people struggling with in their everyday life? Uh, what kind of issues do they have? And um, everyday life is, of course, again, incredibly complex. Um, we cannot study it. That makes it also very, very difficult. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's very hard to predict also what people will deal with in their everyday life. But um, I do find this fascinating. But and to narrow it down, I ended up um, and slowly started expanding there, working on financial well-being and financial capabilities because our finances. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I I wasn't trained in in finances in any way. But we all deal with our finances, our house household finance. We cannot in any way move around it, um, and it has such a major impact. On our everyday life especially when there's problems there um, and um, this is something that um, yeah I learned more and more over time and uh, I love the topic and I'm really fascinated about it and really want to well do something more there because we hardly study this if we talk about um, a lot of conditions like neurological conditions or psychiatric condition doesn't matter which one um, we're often very much focused on 
the symptoms. It's symptom A, symptom B, symptom C, and so on. Um, but people in the end have to live with that condition. And um, finances, whether we want to or not, is a very important part of our everyday life. So that's where these two worlds, for me, come together. Um, and I and I really think that deserves a lot of attention because it can go so terribly wrong. Yeah, the financial side of things is one of the ad adult problems that I think everyone starts to face. But when we talk about like, especially in particular with ADHD, a lot of the stuff that gets stressed is the way that we function in society around other people of the general public as well, too. That's just impulse behaviors and things of this sort. Well, you know, that would come with some risks to the financial side of things. Memory issues, not paying bills on time, being late to bills or whatever you have to say on that aspect of things but then you have the impulsivity spending which then comes in when we deal with things like anxiety and depression that start to manifest so i'm curious is there a distinct difference between different cognitive disorders that are either at like a scale from like one to ten that's worse or better i'm not trying to get you to rate the disorders but when it comes to issues with the financial side of things because i just hope i'm not the only one that's looking at my bills and being like oh my god um, which I'm sure that's a lot of people, but it seems like I'm the one that hasn't really picked up the pace of how the whole thing works yet. Yeah. Well, I have to say in general, um, finances, no matter if you have a condition or not, finances can be very, very complicated. Um, and um, we, of course, have relatively simple financial tasks. Um, if you think about, hey, I need to get some groceries, um, that's rather straightforward. Um, I do not know what your tax declaration looks like. Um, mine, I always find very, very complex, hard to understand. Um, and I'm pretty sure there are many tasks, uh, financial tasks that are difficult for absolutely everyone. Um, so I think that's something we have to keep in mind in, in general anyway. So finances are hard. Um, if you ask me to sort of, uh, on a scale from one to 10, say something about different conditions, that's very hard to do uh, as well. Um, I think if we talk, I can talk about an extreme and an extreme case is, for example, people who are in the advanced stages of something like dementia. Um, you know, this is um, this. Yeah, this condition is, is typically known for um, not only for losing uh, capabilities to take care of your finances, but to have an independent living in general anyway. So um, uh, really severe memory loss and um, yeah, severe cognitive impairments in general. I think in, in those conditions, um, um, yeah, it's very hard to take care of your own finance. Somebody really has to take over. Um, if you talk about many other conditions, uh, including ADHD, first of all, there's hardly any research done. So this is a field where we are just starting, but um, there are, yeah, minor difficulties in many people living with these conditions. And so um, ADHD is one of them. That's at least what our studies show so far. Um, and here we see some people who are really having difficulties with their finances. Um, but again, this does not apply to everybody living with that condition. So I also think it's important to um, keep an, 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 an eye on the individual and to look at what the individual living with a certain condition needs. Maybe he or she has no problems at all, but um, another person with ADHD might have uh, problems. As a group, people living with ADHD, we do find that they have problems here, but that's as a group. I have to ask about if there is a thing with ADHD about uh, job bouncing or career bouncing. It's kind of like hobby bouncing from switching to different topics. I would have to think that that would make a fluctuation on the amount of money a person's bringing in. So also their cost of living or their standard of living might fluctuate all the time, which makes it hard to pin down. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have ADHD but chose never to go to a doctor and get medicated. I'm not medicated for it, but because you're just told by society that you it's in your head or you're you'll grow out of it or something of that sort. So you have a lot of people that are managing the best that they possibly can with the materials that they have at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the job bouncing might be underlying it. So um, what we, if it's about ADHD in general, we do not really know the cause. So as I said, the number of studies in this field is very limited. And I think there is a lot of work that we need to do. So um, it will keep me hopefully busy also for the many years to come. Um, but what we do see, if we look more on, on the, um, uh, yeah, from the facts that we do know is that 
we do know that people living with ASG often have a lower income uh, than those of the same age and those of the same uh, gender and education level than those living without ADHD, for example. Um, and that as a consequence of that, that they also um, have less money to spend on a monthly basis. It's, of course, a direct income, a direct consequence and have less money in their savings accounts. Um, we also know that they live more often. Again, this is I'm talking about groups now, not about individuals, but they live more often with their parents, for example, uh, when they are between the ages of 25 and 30. Um, than those living without ADHD. So, and I I can totally uh, imagine that what you say is this this going from one job to the next, um, and in that way not sort of building something up within a certain company and maybe increasing in salary over time. That that might be underlying it. That would be interesting to explore that in 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 due time. Have you done any studies on what ADHD people with ADHD spend their money on, like like prioritization wise on stuff like that? Because I'm really bad with food, um, and like purchasing food options is not the best thing for me. I'm everything else is filled with objects rather than food. So like I'll go and check the fridge, and I'm like, hey, I haven't eaten all day today. It's been about 13 hours. I open up the fridge, and there's like a thing of Jello in there. I'm like, well. That's just not going to sustain me. Yeah, no. <laughs> so just to ask a question, does that mean for you um, that you, you it is about uh, with you about planning ahead with regard to food or is it about the food buying per se or what makes a different food? What makes food buying different from you? For you than buying other things i think it's just the convenience factor if you like for instance if you have to make a plan to go to the grocery store you have to make a plan to do that and a lot of people probably with adhd it's not just a child thing but adult thing that's just not a fun thing sometimes so they don't prioritize it okay okay and i understand what, what you what you mean yeah so um um i do not know we haven't looked into that if there are different um sort of categories if you want to talk about the things you can buy if they have more problems with buying food than with clothes for example um i, I have no data on that uh, i i don't we what we do know is that uh people living with adhd they more often buy on impulse so um i can imagine that if you go to the supermarket and buy a lot of things on impulse you, and later on well you always miss some uh, essential ingredients um but i haven't i have no data on that no. Now, can, yeah. could you yeah. give me one of your studies that you have a lot, a good amount of data on to support? Like, I obviously, like a different conclusion of ADHD and then average neurotypical people, like the difference between them. But can you give me one of your studies that would maybe give some insight for me who has ADHD to understand more about the financial side? Yeah. So, um, what we did um, in one study, we we. First, well, we have a whole test battery that we use, which consists of different tests and questionnaires um, that we uh, use to assess people uh, with and without ADHD. Again, similar uh, roughly with regard to age and gender and level of education. And we first looked on a more, we first took a more of a helicopter view, just uh, um, looking at all the results of the battery. And later on, I zoomed in on one of these tests because it had a, a lot of practical, uh, very practical and everyday task in it. And it would be, it's very interesting to look on those on, on a very detailed level. So what I can tell you first about this helicopter view um, is what we found is that <clears throat> people with uh, ADHD um, often have um, less what we call financial knowledge. Uh, financial knowledge is what I, I mean is that, for example, knowing what a mortgage is, knowing what inflation is and what it does. A credit score. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it's also about um, if you want to take out insurance, for example, how am I uh, organizing that? How should I do that? So that was one aspect. And I can say a little bit more about the details there later on. Um, on top of that, we found that people with ADHD have more difficulties actually making a financial decision. So sometimes you just have to um, well, choose insurance option A or insurance option B or C and so on. That can be complicated decisions. So uh, here we found that they have some more difficulties and this might have to do, and um, that's what we also found is that they tend to avoid um, making financial decisions. So that might also yeah, be related to it that you have the tendency to just push it away and say, I think about this later and not right now. And that this is sort of translated also in, in difficulties making actual uh, decision. Um, 
And what we also found is that this impulsive buying that I, I, I told you about. So that's, that's more the helicopter view um, that um, uh, what we yeah uh, found in our results. And then we zoomed in on, on these, um, uh, especially this financial knowledge and to, to look into in more detail and say, hey, um, we had very practical assignments there. And for example, example, looking at a bank statement, uh, looking at insurance forms, um, talking with people about the bills that come in. Um, so everyday financial stuff, basically. Um, and that's also where, where we looked into. And here we found that people um, with ADHD, they had, for example, more difficulties with keeping an overview of all the bills uh, that came in. So they we're not always fully aware of all the bills that came in and when they should be paid exactly um, uh, and so on. Um, we also found that they had less often a reserve fund for unexpected uh, expenses. So washing machine breaking down or having car trouble where you need a bit of money for. Um, they were not always aware of their own income. So they knew that they had an income, of course. But then they were less often aware where it was exactly coming from and how much money was coming in. That's funny because I just got my uh, bank password on the app to figure out how much. So I was always for the past couple of years have just been checking my bank card at the ATM. I'm like, well, I got money today, um, which now I'm like, wait, I can see it on my phone and how much I'm actually making this week. This is awesome. But then it's like I have to keep resetting the password because I forget it. <laughs> okay yeah that's it yeah it's an essential detail of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um let's see um yeah what we also found um is that uh if we talk about insurance plans um i do not know what they look like uh in the us but here they are often rather complicated so that you uh, have many different options a lot of details in it um, especially about medical insurance plans about kind of treatment you might use in the future um and that they had difficulties also comparing those. Um, and we also found that, and that was also something that was rather interesting, I found that uh, about one in four people living with ADHD uh, in our sample uh, also dealt with legal actions uh, because of debts that they uh, made. Um, so that that was um, a rather high number because we in our control group, it was only 2% of people, um, while it was around 25% in our ADHD group. So many also deal with legal trouble there. So like legal actions, like not paying back debts and also like could taxes be a problem as well, too, if they don't get their taxes in on time? Could be for many different reasons. We didn't ask for what was the reason. Uh, uh, so what kind of debts did you make? Um, but we know, for example, they did a very large uh, population study in, in Sweden, which was very interesting. Um and uh, they looked into um, uh, the, the arrears that uh, people with ADHD made uh, in, in certain periods of time. And they, this was um, in many different areas. So it could be that people were be uh, behind with uh, paying taxes or that they um, got a speeding ticket and didn't pay that uh, or that they were behind in paying the alimony that they were supposed to do. So really, um, you name it and, it and it was on the list. So it could be all over over the place. So it really depended, uh, and that's uh, how I interpret it, on the individual and what was relevant in their everyday life. Um, and that's something then if you look on a group level again, you see a very uh, varied picture, very heterogeneous picture in the end of where the, the money trouble is. So we didn't ask if we, if we talk about the legal actions that uh, were there for that, for what kind of debts that, that were underlying this, but we do know that at least in our sample, um, that one in four people with ADHD actually deal with these uh, kind of issues. Um, and what was also very interesting, um, what I found is that um, one in three would actually um, like for someone else to take care of their finances. That's so actually that they do not. Yeah. That's actually pretty interesting because there's um if you look this up about ADHD and relationships, a lot of people that have ADHD tend to find a partner who is more organized and more put together when it comes to their work and lifestyle. And their specific example was someone that could do the bills and be able to handle the more financial actions. And that's just interesting to me. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm not going to lie. My past girlfriends were all pretty good financial wise. <laughs> I was not the best. <laughs> 
They were like, you have to pay this. I was like, all right, yeah, go ahead. You know what my card password and everything is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what? Maybe, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, you, you know, of course, uh, we all have our, our weaknesses. And uh, maybe you indeed, if you think about romantic relationships, you look for somebody who can sort of compliment you in, in, in certain areas. And um, then it might be in, in these areas. Um, because there was also that there was a very recent study that came out a few months ago um, that also I, I thought was fascinating because what they asked people with ADHD, um, um, they asked them all, what are your needs uh, and um, what, uh, or especially what are your unmet needs at this moment? And one of the main unmet needs um, that was mentioned was actually financial support. And then not so much in saying, hey, we need money, but more like we need somebody to help us to take care of our finances. So that adds up to, to what you just uh, told me. There's that's, a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. There's a lot of your studies with this, like the end goal, like if you're able to be able to show a good amount of data to support that, obviously, ADHD people struggle more fi with financial decisions and adult problems than neurotypicals or uh, whichever you want to say. But I I'm curious, does that would this be an thing that society has to catch up with? Like, obviously, there's benefit programs for people that have certain disabilities. Um, ADHD has a benefit program as well, too. But also, there's a large stigma that comes with ADHD when it comes to slowly being accepted at this point. So I'm curious if like, obviously, I mean, if a person gets a speeding ticket and they're like, OK, I got a week to pay this off. If you tell me I have a week to pay something off, that week is I'm not going to know when that week. It could be tomorrow. It could be, you, you know, it's a, a normal person knows it's a week. But for a person with ADHD, that time does not exist. That's something in the future. And then it gets here and then it gets late. And then next thing you know, you're in jail or you're paying a ticket or you're paying a fine or whatever it is. So I'm wondering if this, I mean, obviously I would hold myself responsible, but also at the same time, it's, should there be more easier restrictions or at least a leniency when it comes to someone who does have some type of cognitive disorder. We'll do it with other things that are more serious, like Alzheimer's is a serious one. Um, dementia is a very serious one. ADHD, I'm not comparing those at all. I'm just saying that it's still getting recognized as a disorder and we should start looking into it and at least talking about it a little bit more to maybe get society to meet us halfway in this issue. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think what is going on in this field, at least that's how I experience it, is that at the moment we do not have enough attention for this topic. Um, so I think in general, in society, um, we need a lot more understanding um, for what it is to have ADHD and uh, to basically get information out there, whether or not you um, um, yeah, work in a supermarket or whether or not you work in healthcare. Um, I think uh, having knowledge about what it means to have a certain condition, including ADHD, is very beneficial, just as you say, because um, there is a lot of stigma uh, there. Um, if, if people indeed need to be lenient or not, I do not know. Um, that, that's very hard to answer. Um, I think what is for now important, and that's also my sort of bigger aim, and that is not only applying to ADHD, but also to uh, people living with other conditions, is that we have to be aware that um, if, we, if we talk about finances, that this is already difficult in general anyway, and that it might be even more difficult for people living with a, with a certain condition. And that we have to, first of all, learn about it, what kind of problems people run into, what the consequences of these problems are, um, but also that we need to invest um, literally uh, time-wise, money-wise, into support programs, whatever that may look like, even if it's only um, a website um, with information about how to organize something, let's say how to organize your insurances, or that there are certain apps available um, that people can use. And preferably that would be sort of the ideal um, uh, thing to do is that we can also um, adapt these, uh, let's say we make an app uh, and we adapt this app and make one that is specific for people living with ADHD. So for example, what you just said in your example, if it's about if you have to pay a bill or the ticket that you have within a week, that um, maybe the, your app can then help you to remind you in, in, in one way or uh, another. Just so to make life a little bit easier because 
I think when it comes down to finances, um, and that's just in general, we have a very much a approach that is about one size fits all. So we all have to follow a certain rules, a certain path. This is how it works, and this is how you should do it. Um, but I think here, and I, uh, uh, people working in finances might have a totally different view on these things, but I think a bit of flexibility there would, in general, not only for people uh, having ADHD, but in general, would sometimes be um, um, good just to adapt it a little bit to the person and their needs instead of these rigid, um, well, rules that are, are sometimes there. I know that they have to be there, but maybe we have to look a little bit more on what individuals need. And we need more understanding about what's actually going on. Now, is it hard to, when you're doing samples and you're trying to get more study, like people involved in your research, like are people open about speaking that they have ADHD and trying to get those control groups? And because I feel like for the longest time, you know, I always kept it quiet. You weren't supposed to really recommend it to your employer that you had ADHD because then they would kind of look at you a little bit different. Yeah, well, we I must say that if it's about uh, recruiting people for our studies, that um, this runs via um, hospitals. So these are already people who go to a hospital to get a diagnosis. So, um, and this is where we then usually ask them and say, hey, we have a study running, would you be interested in participating? Um, so um, when we talk about that, um, I do not really have problems uh, finding people, but I can imagine what you just said that uh, I would run into more trouble when I uh, would, for example, just have an advertisement in a, uh, in a local newspaper and saying, hey, I'm looking for people who have ADHD. It, it, that might be uh, um, uh, more difficult. Um, on the other hand, and that's something I have to stress, of course, if somebody participates in our studies, this is something that we do completely confidential. Um, so we meet one on one. Um, somebody's then coming in for assessment. So the only person who would know somebody has a diagnosis of ADHD is the person who is actually um, then also doing the assessment. So uh, and that would stay within in the room and um, nobody could ever, if we publish a paper uh, on that, know, hey, this was this and this person who participated. Nobody would know that. So in that way, we um, try also to take away worries uh, like that. Do you have any surveys or studies that you've tried to attempt to do, or do you have any ideas that you'd like to do about like a certain area that maybe doesn't have any research in it that you would like to more head in towards when it comes to a direction? You mean in, in general with regard to um, financial um, and ADHD, like if there's financial a certain, and ADHD, yeah, it could be like one of those things that's like, it seems like it might just be a fringe thing or something small. Like I've mentioned a couple about like my own personal experience, like groceries and stuff like that. But when it comes to like an area that you'd like to maybe explore a little bit more. Yeah. Well, well as I said, um, there's hardly any studies here. So I believe um, our first study came out in 2019. Uh, and this was that's the new. First, that's like that's, brand new. Yeah. And that was, as far as I am aware, uh, and, and hopefully I didn't miss anything, but it was uh, the first study actually looking into finances and, and ADHD. There's a few studies uh, around now. So, um, um, so this is very slowly increasing. So we are just starting. And um, what I would like to do in the next few years uh, in collaboration with with uh, many other people is to first of all, understand a little bit more about the everyday life. So we, we tested people, so we assessed them with a lot of tests. And as I said, we asked them a lot of questions and gave them assignments and so on. But I wanna learn more about what they actually experience in everyday life. So also what you already telling me um, about, um, especially buying food, that that's an, um, uh, an issue for you. I find this very interesting because I immediately wonder Maybe there are other people who uh, also experience it like that, or they have different categories. So I want to learn more about everyday life and uh, what is going on there. So um, if we talk about finances, and I, I want to do this in different ways. Um, on the one hand, we can talk about uh, actually giving people questionnaires and saying, hey, can you um, share with us, if you think back about the last year, for example, uh, which areas, if we talk about finances in this year, did you run into trouble? Uh, or what was difficult for you, for example? Was this when we talk about paying your bills? Or was this when talking about 
uh, taking care of your taxes um, or you name it. So there's many tasks that we have when it's about finances that people might have trouble with. So that's really tell us more about that. You um, should test more around holidays. I know it sounds crazy, but just trust me on it in particular Christmas time. There's something that comes with ADHD. I think a lot of people experience, which is shame. And one of the shame aspects to it is the fact that you might not be able to get everyone in your family Christmas presents. Maybe that's just me, but I feel like that's a common thing because it is a big weight. And it's also seen in, especially most most kids, it's prioritized as this eventful day and it's always Christmas. Like that's, oh, you got to stay home for Christmas. You got to hang out with your family on Christmas. Look around that time and see what their financial kind of uprisings or interests were i guarantee you most of it's christmas presents and none of it's for themselves okay good very good tip i think that's very interesting um i'll definitely look into that um so it's when i'm the most broke (laughs) (laughs) okay good to know yeah no it might be that this place uh uh, in certain periods of the year more can also be uh, i don't know around the holidays when people really want to leave for a certain while and and want to go somewhere it's also something that often costs a lot of money but i don't know i'm I'm thinking out loud now um yeah so very interesting but that's what i want to learn more so i want to understand what's actually going on in everyday life and finances is of course if you think about it it's a very privacy sensitive topic um it's not something that we go around and saying, um, hey, I have debts or um, I uh, do not have enough income. Of course, some people are easier in talking about that than others. But in general, um, I cannot walk up to somebody and say, hey, uh, let me look into your bank account and through all these else. Give me your password, like you just said. Uh, give me your password and I, I, I can see everything. That's not something we do and that's something we cannot do because that's privacy. Um, but if people are willing to talk about that, and then, then I do not need uh, full details about how much debt that you have and where the problems occur, but in more in general terms, I think we can learn a lot about that. And um, another thing that I would like to do, if also uh, able to manage that, is to just have interviews with people and to learn their own private uh, personal story. So also learning about how did they grow up with money? So um, did they learn from their parents, for example, Um, or is it something that they had to find out by themselves over time? Um, Some uh, parents um, have a, um, they already give their their children uh, a bit of money where they can, I don't know, have a bit of pocket money where they uh, buy, I don't know, something in school or that they buy clothes. Uh, People have very different approaches uh, there. Um, so how did they grow up with money? And then at a certain moment, um, what went wrong? So uh, how did you build up debts if you if you have them? What what happened? Um, would you like support for it, or do, or do you already have support for it? Um, can everybody has their own personal story? But in these personal stories, you can I think you can learn a lot about how people actually deal with. Um, Uh, this topic and the issues that uh, we have. And in that way, we can again learn um, about what is going on um, if we talk about finances and ADHD. So that's sort of the future plans that I have. It's all all centers around understanding what the issues are, if there are issues, um, and because that might differ between people. And um, also what kind of support would somebody need to first get an understanding of that. And then if we have a good understanding of that, then also move into and look more into how can we support, what can we do there, and what can we do about awareness um, if uh, in people living with ADHD themselves, but also for the healthcare professionals. Why did it take so long for someone to think about the financial side when it comes to ADHD? I mean, is that with the stigma or is that the privacy information? I'm guessing it's probably a mixture of the two, but I would have to think that there's plenty of research out there about personal care when it comes to an ADHD person, either doctor's appointments or thing of, things of that sort. I'm sure we're neglecting in that. I don't think I've been to the doctor in like four years. Um, it's not that I don't trust doctors. It's just, it's a, it's like 20 minutes away, man. That's, yeah. that's pretty hey, far. I, I think, yeah, <laughs> true. Um, I do not know. I think there might be different reasons for it. And, and what you just said, why wasn't there no attention for it? Um, that does not only apply to ADHD, that also applies to other conditions. I think 
The only exception there is again dementia. So this is where, because if that's where it really goes wrong and where people have a lot of issues, but if it's about a lot of other um, conditions like ADHD, um, we focused at least from a neuropsychological point of view, a lot on the more traditional uh, cognitive impairments that people might have. So we looked into attention and we looked into planning and we looked into um, memory and, and so on. So that's sort of the traditional uh, approach. And I think if you think about um, psychologists and their, well, their their more traditional approach, we are not trained into looking into finances. That is in, oh, might even uh, appear to be far-fetched um, because as I said, I'm also not uh, trained uh, in that. But I think if you take that into consideration and then adding up perhaps the stigma, perhaps the privacy, you have a whole mixture of factors that might play a role here while we didn't pay attention to this before. Well, it becomes a bigger issue in today's time when money seems to be getting tighter for a lot of people. And it seems like a lot of choices and a lot of things are going by the wayside because people have to save money. I mean, I know everybody's scraping around. I mean, if you wanted to know my family background, my family was poor. I had parents that worked two jobs. Nobody was really home. So I, I can understand where I'm missing a good chunk of information like mortgages and those types of things. But I also think that's becoming more of the world as well now, too. I'm seeing a lot of kids like areas in particular in my area that have completely changed to either single moms or single dads that are raising a bunch of kids and are never home. that have to give them McDonald's or something. So it's it's hard to think of priorities when it comes to health, when it comes to financial decisions, because you have to cut so much because all the budgets are going up now. Absolutely. And I think that's in general a big issue that our entire society is facing. So we see in general that uh, poverty rates are going up. They are really increasing. And uh, this applies for many, many countries. I uh, also heard the other day that was in the news here that uh, poverty rates in the United Kingdom, for example, went up to 40%. If you just think about that, these are huge numbers. Um, so. I think, yes, um, this is a societal issue that uh, we all have to deal with. And what we also know, and that has a lot to do with scarcity, there's also whole theories on that. Um, if we have scarcity, if it's either money or time or, or whatever, we, um, we can talk about uh, scarcity for money here. We have the tendency, which is very natural, to think about very short-term decisions. It's about okay, I uh, let's say I have 10 euros and uh, I need to have food on the table this evening. Then uh, this is what I'm thinking about. I need to uh, feed my family, for example. Um, if you are in a situation like that, you do not think about very long-term financial goals, just also because you do not have the means to do that. So when we lack something we tend to make very short-term decisions that work for us in the short term but they might not work for us in in the long term or they might not be the best for us in in, in the long term even though they are very very understandable uh, of course so that's also something that scarcity uh, and poverty and all that is doing with us um, and also of course what you see in in societies is that the gap between um, uh, the rich and the poor is becoming bigger. We also yeah. see that changing. There's no middle now. class anymore. No, that's sort of disappearing. And there's also uh, studies around that show that the bigger this gap becomes between rich and poor, um, that the more problems that are there in the end in certain countries. So we see that the bigger the gap, the, the higher uh, or the, the more people deal with uh, mental health issues. Um, uh, things like that, for example, more uh, um, use of drugs and alcohol and things like that. So all of these things, even uh, from that point of view, also from that point of view, in one way or another, money and the money that we make uh, has an influence on us on a societal level and also on an individual level. And um, yeah, that's, again, another reason why I think it's very important to pay attention to this topic. There's a, with um, ADHD, there's a addiction aspect to it. They can get addicted to things pretty easily. I luckily am addicted to working out, um, but I do like the occasional alcohol, but there's a thing with it where I have friends that are, I wouldn't call them alcoholics, but they'll go and buy alcohol over getting groceries where I'm like, no, you need to eat food. And like, no, this gives me a better rush than anything. And I'm like, 
that's the dopamine that you're chasing after because you have ADHD. So like you're only creating a cycle there. And I only think that it gets worse, especially if you think about if someone has to budget with their money, they can't afford groceries, but they have just enough to get a bottle of booze or something of that sort. I mean, I live in the third most dangerous state in the United States, which is Baltimore, Maryland. And there's people all over the street, either nodding out on heroin or something like that. And it's like, it's not a it's not a class issue. It's just there's there's no money here. There's we're severely poor in certain parts of this area. That's why these neighborhoods look like this. It's not that these are bad people. They're just standard cost of living is nineteen seventy five, and the average rate I think per hour is thirteen twenty five minimum wage. I'm like you're there's not it's that those those don't match. And I would have to think with your research, this has to fluctuate a lot with the financial side of things because of the fact whatever whoever's president who at least for the united states i mean i know maybe your research is focused somewhere else but i would have to think when you're looking at the financial dealings that's war that's going on that's anything that can cause the market to shift yeah yeah well my my studies um mainly take place in in the netherlands and also in germany so we have collaborations um um, with germany um but these countries are if we think about well wealth relatively similar they're of course not the same um but um, uh, I think also here, of course, uh, there are gaps between uh, the rich and the poor. And also here, there are people who are showing that this gap is becoming bigger and bigger. Um, so that, that definitely also plays a, a role here. And if we think about drug use, um, I haven't looked into this in, um, in, in people uh, with ADHD. That might also be worth exploring. Um, in due time, but we have studies running at the moment also on uh, people going through psychosis. And uh, in them, we also see uh, they report then also uh, a, a drug use. And um, we also ask them about how financially dissatisfied that they are. And what we found is that the higher their financial dissatisfaction, um, the more drug use and alcohol use they uh, often have. So I think drugs are also used uh, and also alcohol to sort sort of deal with certain situations, to numb certain feelings, perhaps uh, also. So it's often also these short term decisions that I said with scarcity um, that might not always be the best for us in, in, in the long run, but it helps us right now. This is what I need right now. Um, but yeah, that, that doesn't help in the, in, in the longer run. And on top of that, it's often rather expensive. So alcohol is not cheap. Drugs are not cheap. Um, so you spend also a lot of money on that. And, and then you might have less money for, for food or for clothes or for some other basic needs that you, that you have. So um, even though the situation uh, is different um, it, between the US and, and uh, countries here in Europe, I'm pretty sure that the general picture uh, is more or less the, uh, the same. So um, people, yeah, they are in a, in a situation where uh, they use uh, drugs to deal with their everyday situation. Um, but um, yeah, it's financially, this is not always the best thing uh, for them. If more studies come out and you, obviously in a couple of years, more research going on, is better education for maybe kids and teaching young adults with ADHD? Like you mentioned a couple of programs if there was an online website or something like that. But I feel like with better education would help. But also if the, you showed the government, at least my government, your studies that there's obviously a financial struggle with people with cognitive disorders and it's causing them to be late on certain things. I would have to say that the government cares so much about their money and they're going to try and find a way to make sure that these people are able to get the money paid in on time and get them the materials that they need yeah well i i think um what you see often uh if it's about government programs is that of course they have financial programs where they try to uh teach certain things to to people and uh to well to basically explain uh, what they need to do to do certain uh, uh things financially um what is the problem, I think, with these programs, even though they are meant well, is that um, they are often not there at the right time. So, for example, um, it might be that I'm now in a course um, and, and learning about tax declaration. Um, so I'm, I'm right in the middle of that, but my actual tax declaration is months away. So by the time that I actually need to do it, um, this, well, information my, went to the back of my mind and I, I do not have the details. So it's not there at the right time. So that that's one thing. 
that's often, I think, going wrong with these programs and why it does not work out in, in, in daily practice. And another thing is, is that here again, it's about one size should fit all. So I think if, if we talk about these programs, they do not take into account what is difficult for people living with ADHD or what is difficult for people um, having a psychosis. It should just fit everybody in the population. That's, of course, um, um, a rather straightforward approach, but not always the, the approach that has the best results. So I think also to move forward, um, we need to learn um, what is well, what the issues are of people with ADHD, then, for example, and what they need in their financial programs. And it needs to be flexibly available so that if I think about my tax declaration, um, that I can actually look up somewhere and what I need to do and not think back about a course that I had, I don't know how many months uh, ago. So that's something I think we we have to, um, at least a first step uh, into improve um, these entire situations. Are you able to separate like the difference between a person who has ADHD that's medicated and a person who's unmedicated? Does the medication help with any of their financial dealings or is that just something that's hindered by both for both of them? I do not know. So we did our studies in people who are unmedicated. Um, so uh, th th that's, that's uh, what our study focused on. I can imagine that medication has an effect. So we know, of course, in general, that uh, medication can have effects also on cognitive function, so on, on, uh, on tension and planning and, and so on. So I can imagine that um, if we um, uh, study a group of people who are medicated and maybe compare them ideally uh, to those who are not medicated, that we we find some some effects of medication. But at the moment, I do not know. We haven't done any studies there. Because I took some Adderall and I painted a really good painting and cleaned out my car, but I don't didn't do anything with my taxes or my bank account. <laughs> For next time. <laughs> <laughs> Got to yeah. prioritize. Yeah. You've got to um, prioritize, absolutely. Yeah, but I do not know. I can't imagine that there are effects, but I, I have no data to support it. Have you reached out to any other ADHD researchers or anyone that focuses on certain areas that maybe not deal with the financial side of things, but more of the emotional and kind of the things that would lead to some like the impulse buying and some of the memory issues? Yeah, um, so I, I collaborate with a lot of ADHD uh, researchers, so they are in, involved in in, in um, uh, studies. So that's they are in, in, from that point of view involved. And um, if it's about ADHD, particularly, uh, for example, I also presented these results now uh, at, at the World ADHD Conference. Uh, so there's a lot of clinicians and also researchers uh, involved in this uh, uh, field. Um, and we presented the results also there. So that's how I try to uh, inform us, uh, inform everybody. And also our papers, we make them publicly available so that they are not behind these, these sort of payment walls um, and are only accessible for the scientific community. So that's how we uh, try to uh, get more awareness uh, of that. Um, and I, I, I that's why I'm happy to also participate in, in podcasts like what you are doing today, just to very slowly, and that's unfortunately often takes a lot of time to expand uh, on all this um, and, and to um, well provide people with a lot of information. So that's how we've been reaching out to the to the community so far. And I, this is a personal question, but from your own perspective, do you notice that the academic community and then average citizens are becoming more open to understanding or accepting ADHD? I still find hesitancy sometimes. I'm sure. I'm sure. I can totally imagine that you find hesitancy, but I think it's a very hard question to answer because I think I have a, a biased approach there or a biased view on Because you're on reaching it because... out to the ADHD people. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm reaching out, um, especially to people who are already interested uh, in, in this field or who, who deal with it in one way or another. So I think I have a very biased view on, on that. Um, so I find it's hard to um, uh, answer your question. I think in general, um, we have to be very much aware also of, of stigma here and, and the role of that. And um, I think, therefore, again, what you're doing also with this podcast and us just talking about it um, is is extremely important. So that we just that it's out there and people who are interested can can look into it. And also those who might be skeptical or, or might wonder about certain things that at least that they can get more information. 
I think that that's something that's very important. But yeah, I cannot give you an, an unbiased answer. Now, when you go to these ADHD conferences, I mean, what, what are those like? Are, do a lot of people there have ADHD? I've been explained a couple of times about like what the conferences are. But I, I, I mean, I think there's one happening near me a couple hours away from me. So I was interested in going and they said I would be accepted as to go. I mean, I don't want to offer any advice or anything. I'm just interested in wanting to know like if everyone's on, like for me, it helps me connect with someone when they tell me that I research ADHD, but I also have it. Not the financial side is different. You don't have to have ADHD. I feel like for that one, but for, if you look at like the mental stuff, like to truly understand, cause like some of the biggest researchers I've talked to like popular names, I'm not going to say their name on the show, but like we, we could talk off air about it, but the way that they described a certain situation with someone with ADHD, I'm like, well, be careful. Cause that can make us sound like we're mentally unstable and we can end up in, and it's just the impulsive anger issues while driving sometimes. And it's like, I know he didn't mean it that way. But it's just also the language type thing, whether I'm being sensitive or whether it's just a way that it can be misinterpreted as such. And I'm like, so I'm just curious when it comes to these conferences, do, do you come across a lot of people that research or get interested in this that also have it? Um, no. So oh. that doesn't mean that they do not have it. So the thing is that if you go there, it's um, there. I think the last conference was last May in Amsterdam. That was the World hey, ADHD Conference. I want to go to that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that will be in Prague uh, in twenty twenty five. Out of the top of my head. Oh, that's so far away. It doesn't so exist far. to me right now. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's far in the future. Anyway, um, this is a conference. I do not know how many participants were there, but I would guess around fifteen hundred to two thousand people. So it's very, very hard to get an overview of who is actually there. Um, and of course, people just have their name tag on. And I, you talk to some people, but I do not know about their backgrounds very much. So I do know that there are clinicians there. Um, and I do know that there are researchers there. I also know that there are people there who have ADHD, but I do not know uh, how many people are actually there with having a, a ADHD, who are, how many clinicians are there, how many researchers. And also if you talk about researchers who have ADHD, this mixture, um, I, I cannot give you an, any idea about that. So that's also, of course, uh, do people even open up about that? That's of course a, a big question. So I don't know. I hope uh, I, I would, um, I think it would be great if also people with ADHD go to these conferences. Uh, I was at a smaller uh, symposium a uh, little over a week ago that was in Germany. Um, and um, that was very, um, uh, there was a small group around 60 people. Again, a mixture of healthcare professionals, researchers. And there, I um, um, in these smaller groups, you become more aware of who's actually there. There were several people uh, also having ADHD and uh, coming to these presentations to learn more about that. So then you're more easily in, in, in uh, uh, contact, I feel. But in these big conferences, a lot of information is also lost in in numbers because it's huge yeah yeah um so i, I yeah I, I i do not know that's basically a very long answer to tell you i do not know you mentioned uh potentially wanting to interview people with adhd uh, and having certain questions is there studies i mean i mean do you have any studies that you're trying to work on that you need certain individuals of a certain does it have to just be adhd or are you looking for any other cognitive disorders as well too we, we look also in other cognitive uh, disorders so um we have uh, at the moment a big study running into psychosis what i already told you a little bit about and um we will now uh, soon start a study that looks into uh, everyday finances so how did you do in the last year um uh, in many different areas when it comes down to household finances in people living with various uh, um, disorders or that might also have cognitive impairments. So we want to look into people um, who also have, have been diagnosed, for example, with an alcohol use disorder, uh, with depression, um, with ADHD, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, exactly. That's also part of the psychosis, of course. Um, so we want to learn uh, also from other conditions here, um, because I think it's interesting to 
look into what is going on in a particular condition, but also to look if there's differences uh, and similarities between these uh, different conditions. So what does everybody need and where do they run into um, what is going well, but also what is not going well. So yes, we, we do plan to do that. The studies, the data is, uh, collection should start soon. So, And uh, is there a place where people can find any of your links, um, any works that you have out there? If you have a Twitter, or any social media handles? Uh, I, I don't have uh, uh, Twitter. I, I every now and then post something on uh, LinkedIn. So uh, that's uh, something I have. And I have a personal page also from the university that I work for where all my scientific articles are also uh, listed. And if people are interested, um, I'm also happy. Uh, they can contact me also via email. I'm happy to provide them with uh, uh, our articles, for example, or more information. Then feel free to uh, contact me. And I'll, I'll link your research gate and all the other stuff that you have um, on there for people to be able to click and check out some of your work. I really do appreciate the work that you are doing out there for um, not just ADHD people, but obviously anybody that's coming or having issues with uh, cognitive disorders when it comes to financial stuff. I mean, that's important. I didn't really think about it until I came across your page and I was like, wait a minute. I was like, that's right. I was like, well, I'm not just a financial loser. I don't have to keep g gambling. There's another one. Another addiction that people get sucked into is the gambling stuff. And I mean, you got to think if you're worried about how much money you're going to be making this week and you don't have enough, maybe you can go gamble it and see that's a, that's bad risk decisions that comes with ADHD. Yes. Yes. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, in our studies, we, uh, by the way, didn't see that uh, people with ADHD uh, took more risks. So, um, but of course, in, in some of them, uh, gambling is, a, is an issue. So uh, I think um, we have to also replicate uh, our studies. Uh, that's something that's very important because we never know if there's bias in there or not. Um, but yeah, I think on an individual basis, I haven't, we didn't find the risk taking, but um, it doesn't mean it's not there. So we have to keep uh, an eye out uh, as well for that. And um, I, I think it's great what you say also about, um, um, yeah, being that you appreciate this topic, because I think it is very important uh, to link, uh, look into that, because the more I work on this topic, um, the more I also see how important it is, because um, you hear really terrible stories sometimes about how things can go terribly terribly wrong and the trouble that people get into and there's of course financial trouble but this financial trouble has massive influence on their everyday life and it can be um in so many aspects that you have to think about where where your next meal is coming from or where to buy your clothes but also whether or not you can um uh, still do your hobbies for example because being a member of a let's say a sports club or or whatever kind of club you're on or going to uh, the cinema with your friends or meeting them for dinner or whatever you like to do we live in a world where everything is costing money so if you do not have that money and you are in trouble in 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 in, in a minor way or even in a major way it impacts you um and not only financially but also socially and mentally um and i think yeah therefore we have to also in healthcare look into household finance well, I'll be sharing this episode. You can, pro I can promise you that. Um, I appreciate the time and I'm going to link all your links in the description for anybody listening. You can check out the description of this podcast episode and find all her research links. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of out of the blanket. Stay tuned for our next episode.